Mackenzie. So uh, Mackenzie Russell started marine um, or studied marine biology at the University of North Carolina in Wilmington, specializing in marine mammalogy with a focus in osteology. There she earned both her BS and MS in marine biology. Her master's work focused on skeletal fractures caused by blunt trauma in five species of cetaceans. From there, she worked in Texas, Massachusetts, Florida, and now Alabama. She has been the stranding coordinator for the Alabama Marine Mammal Stranding Network for two years. Her job duties include coordinating responses to all live and dead marine mammals, including dolphins, whales, and manatees that strand in Alabama and manatees that strand in Mississippi. She also performs necropsies or animal autopsies on dead, stranded marine mammals to determine cause of death and collect samples to perform research on the population's of marine mammals that call the northern Gulf of Mexico home. And her fun fact is that she has a coral reef tank at her home. So I'll switch it over to you, Mackenzie. Awesome. Thank you so much for the intro and thanks so much for having me. Um, I can't see any of you guys while you're watching because I can only see my, my presentation, um, but I'm sure all your faces look lovely. I'll see them at the end. Um, but I'm really uh, excited to give you guys a, a talk today about what we do at the Marine Mammal Stranding Network. Um, so we are based down at the Dauphin Island Sea Lab, so I'm not sure if you guys are all familiar uh, with the Sea Lab, but of course it's on Dauphin Island. It's an education facility. We have, um, you know, it's a, a kind of conglomerate um, made up of several different universities that actually buy into the lab and have different faculty um, housed there as well as um, research facilities. We have an estuarium, um, so a public aquarium, which is a great um, fun thing to go and see. Um, and then we also have the Marine Mammal Research Program. So I'm going to kind of start my talk off today talking about just in general what we do um, at the Marine Mammal Research Program. So we do have two branches of the Marine Mammal Research Program at the Sea Lab. Um, both of them are run by our director, who is Dr. Ruth Carmichael. Um, she founded the Manatee Sighting Network uh, in 2007 and then the Alabama Marine Mammal Stranding Network in 2011. Uh, so she's kind of the the fearless leader of both of our groups. Um, but the Manatee Sighting Network uh, is managed by Elizabeth Heeb, who you guys will actually be hearing from tomorrow, I believe. So I'm not really gonna touch on the Manatee Sighting Network, but you guys will get more um, of a education on that uh, tomorrow. Uh, we also, like I will be talking about today, have the Alabama Marine Mammal Stranding Network. So that is the dead, dying, sick, injured, all of those, with them, you know, the fun stuff compared to live happy manatees. Um, but I am the straining coordinator for that program and I've been here for two years. Um, we also have an assistant straining coordinator um, of various uh, number of students that help with us. We've got volunteers. Um, we've got about 75 volunteers that work with us regularly, uh, not in times of a pandemic, unfortunately, um, but we're hoping to get them back soon. Um, we also have uh, students. So we've got master's student, PhD students. Um, we've got all sorts of staff, um, technicians, and interns as well. So we've got a lot of people that work with the, the stranding network um, in the research program. So for stranding and sighting response, um, we are the only local group that collects these data uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, we document 100% of strandings as well as sighting reports. Um, so Elizabeth will talk to you more about that tomorrow uh, when it comes to how she manages the sighting response um, for you know live happy manatees. And then I'm gonna be telling you a little bit about how we manage the stranding response um, for things that aren't so live and happy. Um, and we also provide mutual aid uh, to neighboring states as well. So um, that'll be both for uh, manatee sightings, letting people know if manatees are in their area, um, and also receiving sighting reports from other states, and then also assisting when it comes to strandings, um, working with rehab groups, that sort of thing when it comes to the, the non-live and non-necessarily happy marine mammals. So at the Marine Mammal Research Program, we are primarily, first and foremost, a research group. Um, so stranding response and, and sighting response is kind of our means to an end of how we actually get our research done. Um, so for our stranding side of things, uh, our pretty much biggest um, research and active research is cause of death determination. 
So we are attempting to figure out, you know, these animals come in either sick um, or dying or dead. Uh, and we try to figure out exactly what happened to them in their life. You know, first of all, what caused their death? And then even further past that, you know, what kind of things they went through in their life as well. Uh, so we collect samples for all sorts of uh, additional research um, that hopefully goes into a cause of death determination. And then that will hopefully go on to um, controlling things like management and um, you know, things that we can actually change that maybe are, if we're seeing something going on with our populations of, of marine mammals here and how we can potentially better um, the, the populations for the rest of the non-dead ones. Um, we also track um, diet as well as movement patterns, um, and we also perform health assessments on live, usually those ones aren't very happy either, uh, marine mammals in our area as well. So with live animal assessments, which you can see in that middle picture, that's actually a, a manatee health assessment um, where we run all sorts of, um, you know, just what you would do if you went to the doctor. So we um, take blood, we tag these animals, which is what you can see around that, the peduncle of that animal, which Elizabeth, again, will talk to you more about. Um, and then we also perform these same health assessments on, on dolphins, which is um, usually a little bit more complicated, but um, virtually about the same thing. And we'll put um, satellite tags on them as well and study their behaviors and their movement, um, take blood, all that sort of thing to try to determine other, other things that are going on in our, our live population. Um, and then actually just last year, we started a photo ID group. So that group actually goes out and monitors the bottomnose dolphins in our area and they're looking to see um, all sorts of different things about, uh, you know, how large the population is here, where they move, um, health, um, that sort of thing, uh, without actually going out and catching those dolphins, they'll actually be able to do that all through um, cameras and boats. So it's a pretty cool deal. Um, and I just, here's a plug for everybody. Um, so you can follow us and learn more um, on our Facebook pages. Um, so we have a separate Facebook page for each of the two branches of our groups. Um, so the Alabama Marine Mammal Stranding Network and then um, the Manatee Sighting Network, which is Mobile Manatees. Uh, you can also find out more of a, about us at the Sea Lab website. Um, and then we do have phone numbers to call and report sightings as well as strandings. Um, so those phone numbers will be at the end of the talk as well. But there's lots of different ways to reach out to us and, and find out more about what we're doing and what we're staying busy with and that sort of thing. So I first wanted to kind of just touch on marine mammals of the Gulf. You know, who do we have that lives here? And, um, you know, what exactly does the, the makeup uh, look like in the Gulf of Mexico when it comes to marine mammals? So obviously, just to kind of bring us back to the basics, which I'm sure you guys are all aware of, um, but obviously marine mammals are mammals that live in the ocean um, or the aquatic environment for a lot of them. Um, they breathe air. So a lot of times, you know, we'll get uh, people that'll confuse them with fish um, and think that they, you know, can, can breathe water, but they can't. They actually uh, breathe air only. They are more so like us than fish. Um, they nurse young, they give, um, they have live birth as well. So manatees, uh, they actually nurse their babies up near their axilla, so um, their armpits essentially. Um, and then obviously dolphins are a little bit different because everything is internal on them. So it's a pretty cool mechanism that they actually have to be able to, um, to nurse their young while moving in the water. Uh, and then everybody is actually also born with hair. So a lot of people think of dolphins and, and cetaceans or whales and our dolphins not having hair because in their adult form, they, they don't, but they're actually born with these cute little whiskers. Um, so they're called rostral hairs, right, on their rostrum, which is the front part of their face. Um, they're usually born between with between five and seven to eight um, rostral hairs, and then they'll lose those pretty quickly. Um, so obviously their bodies are built to be streamlined, so they don't have hair for that reason, but they are born with hair, um, and it helps them um, tactically be able to nurse. Um, and then manatees, of course, have uh, a lot of hair, a lot of whiskers um, that kind of give them what we call a sixth sense um, to be able to sense vibrations in, in the water as well. Um, so that's our introduction to marine mammals. Now, a fun little uh, tidbit that I like to talk to people about, especially in the Gulf of Mexico, um, is the difference between a dolphin and a porpoise, because actually not a lot of people know that there is a difference between a dolphin and a porpoise. Um, so a dolphin, if we're looking at their facial structure, so a dolphins, like I just talked about with their little rostral hairs when they're born, um, dolphins actually have a rostrum. So they have this, um, you know, this kind of beak-like projection off the front of their face where you can see a clear definition between where their forehead or their melon actually ends and where their rostrum begins. 
And if you look at a porpoise, a porpoise actually doesn't have that definition. They don't have that additional kind of projection of a rostrum or a beak. Uh, their forehead and their melon just kind of comes to a point. Uh, in dolphins, they actually have conical teeth. So it's another difference between these two. So they have teeth that are shaped more like cones, where if you were to cut them in half, uh, they would actually look like a circle. Um, versus a porpoise, porpoises actually have spade-shaped teeth. So they look more of like our incisors than they do of the conical teeth like dolphins. Um, which is quite interesting. They actually use those teeth uh, to eat things that are more shellfish um, in that kind of realm. So they actually have to do more crushing um, than, than dolphins do. Uh, and then they finally, dolphins have crescent shaped dorsal fins. So the fins that are on the back of them, their dorsal fin is more of a crescent moon shaped versus a porpoise, which has more of a pyramid shaped dorsal fin, uh, which is, you know, just cute and stubby. So my question for you, and I'm not sure if you guys can answer, but if you can, please do, is do we have porpoises in the Gulf of Mexico? Any thoughts? Anybody? Thoughts? I no. would answer this. Been through your, yeah, I've been through your volunteer thing, but yeah. No. Um, good, good, I like it. Okay, good, we're making that connection already. That is right. So we do not have porpoises in the Gulf of Mexico. So if you've already seen this in our, at our volunteer trainings, that's exactly, this is my little spiel that I like to get out to people. Um, Cause a lot of times kind of more of the older folks will hear them call porpoises, um, call all the dolphins in the Gulf um, or the Bay porpoises. Um, and you know, we've got streets named Porpoise Point and things like that, but we actually don't have porpoises in the Gulf of Mexico. So next time you hear somebody saying something about a porpoise, you can, ask them how they were doing when they were in Massachusetts, because that's pretty much where they're probably talking about in the North Atlantic. All right, so um, a little bit about marine mammal stranding. So obviously we know we've got marine mammals in the Gulf of Mexico, um, marine mammals that you know call Alabama and the Northern Gulf home, um, but what exactly does it mean to be a marine mammal stranding? So uh, stranding is defined uh, in three pretty clear ways. Um, first and foremost, a dead marine mammal that is onshore or floating. Um, so that'll be something that we primarily see here in Alabama and along the Northern Gulf is an animal that, that's, that is already dead and is either floating and somebody snaps a picture of it on their boat or an animal that washes up already dead. Uh, a marine mammal stranding is also a live animal that is onshore or unable to return to its natural habitat. Um, so an animal that maybe got stuck behind a uh, construction barrier, that does happen if somebody puts a boom out or something like that and they get trapped in it. Um, or a live animal that comes on shore, so like that middle picture uh, with a live bottlenose dolphin. Uh, and then finally, a free swimming animal that is in need of medical attention. So that's a usually a little bit more complicated. Um, that would be more an, of an example of that picture on the far right of the screen. Um, so that is actually a calf bottlenose dolphin that has an entanglement of fishing line wrapped around its fluke. Um, you can actually see it's dragging uh, a good bit of, of line um, on the underside of that fluke. And then you can actually see where it's cutting into its peduncle as well. Um, but that is uh, a difficult, more difficult situation just simply because we have to determine what is, you know, need of mes necessary medical attention. So that actually goes, photos and videos will go out to a national um, vet group and that vet group will actually discuss amongst themselves if whatever that entanglement or injury or illness that that animal has is life threatening and humans need to intervene in order to prevent the death of that animal. Um, so in that case, with that image on the far right, that actually was determined to be life um, threatening. And the, the veterinarians did determine that that was that something needed to be done um, by us. We needed to interfere and intervene somehow in order to save that animal's life. Um, funny enough, that animal actually was able to shake that entanglement. And we've actually seen him several times since then. Um, without the entanglement. So uh, animals can do very, very amazing things without us knowing that they can. <laughs> Uh, so here at the Alabama Marine Mammal Stranding Network, um, we, like I said earlier, we are the central agency for all marine mammal strandings. So that is um, all cetaceans, so whales, dolphins, um, and porpoises, except not porpoises, uh, and manatees um, for Alabama. And then we are also the permit holder for manatee strandings in Mississippi as well. Um, obviously working with protected species, so all of our uh, marine mammals 
uh, in the United States are protected federally um, by a lot of uh, very fun red tape um, and you know permits being required, that sort of thing. Um, so we respond actually under two different um, departments of the federal government. So when we respond to cetaceans or our whales and our dolphins, uh, we are responding under the Department of Commerce and that's um, through agreements with NOAA and the National Marine Fisheries Service. And when we were responding for manatees, that is actually through the Department of the Interior um, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, so we go and we are permitted by both of those groups and we have to, to answer to both of those groups as well. So because they are all federally protected, we all do um, work very closely with those two departments of the federal government. So a lot of red tape when it goes into um, things dead and dying. Um, so this is a, a kind of our, our norm, normal stats that we would see. So we usually have about 40 cetacean strandings um, per year and usually about one to three manatee strandings per year. Um, that I can tell you uh, this year is already very different than that. We're actually um, already, we're not even halfway through the year and we're at 48 um, strandings for cetaceans. Um, so it definitely is a, a kind of come and go sort of thing, depending on the year. Um, last year, we ended the year at 59 um, cetacean strandings, um, and we actually had five or six manatee strandings last year. So that was also a much higher year. Um, and then this year, we already have one manatee stranding, which I'll tell you a little more about later on. Um, so depends on the year. On average, we usually see about 40 cetacean strandings a year. Um, in most cases, um, all the animals are deceased. We usually will only see about one to four live animal strandings per year. Um, and that's just simply, uh, you know, potentially due to each individual case of what's going on. But we don't often see live animal strandings here. Um, and we do necropsy every animal that is possible, um, which I'll talk a little bit more about as well to, again, determine cause of death and um, lead to potential management changes and things like that. Uh, and the most common species to strand in Alabama are bottlenose dolphins, um, which obviously also make their homes here. So this is uh, where they also live. So it makes sense that we would see more of those um, when they die, um, as well as manatees. So those are our two uh, most commonly stranded um, animals in, in Alabama and in the northern Gulf. Uh, it can depend on the year, though. Sometimes we do get some interesting cases, um, and those are, are kind of a nice change when we have more offshore species. Um, or solitary species that come on shore, but most of the time we're dealing with bottomless dolphins and manatees. Now this is just my little plug. So it already sounds like we already have some volunteers, which is fantastic. Um, but if you guys are interested in um, volunteering with the group or you know um, putting a plug out there for people who live here year round, that sort of thing, um, you can definitely help out. We do take volunteers. Like I said, we've got a great base of about 75 um, active volunteers that work with us. Obviously, a lot of these strandings take a lot of people um, and even necropsies. You know, we usually have about 10, 10 to 12 people in a necropsy. Um, for any given animal. So depending on how that goes too, we do see um, a lot of volunteers. There's a lot of volunteer opportunities. So that's just kind of my little plug for that if you are interested. Um, but what I'm going to do is kind of talk you guys through how we respond to live animals. Um, and then I'll talk about um, dead animal response and necropsy as well. So obviously I put my our, our phone number up here just uh, again, just to clarify, you know, if anybody sees any anything that's uh, live stranded specifically, um, but anything stranded, just give us a call 877 whale help. It's very easy to remember. Um, but talking about our our live animal response. So kind of one of the, the biggest issues that we have with live animal responses, unfortunately, um, is people pushing those animals back in the water. Um, that seems to be just kind of a pretty common theme um, for people to think, you know, this animal lives in the water, we must need to push it back. Um, but unfortunately, uh, that's probably the worst thing that can happen to these animals when they are stranding. They're stranding for a reason, whether they're, um, you know, exhausted, um, they're already sick, they're just trying to take a break, they're trying to figure out, um, get away from predators, that sort of thing. Um, so they will come on shore just simply because they cannot be out in the water anymore, whether that's for a, a myriad of reasons. Um, so one of the worst things to do is push an animal back um, that, you know, can push them back onto the dinner plate of something that maybe was already waiting for them um, back out in the water. Um, actually, in addition to that, it, it's 
difficult for us too, as well as the responders to actually get it and make it to those animals because if people are pushing those animals back, our response is gonna um, you know, take a lot longer in the sense that we don't know where that animal is gonna restrand. Uh, we don't know if that animal is going to restrand. Um, so if we start making our way to one location and people push an animal back, we have no idea where that, that animal is gonna come back and it's just gonna extend the amount of time for us to be able to give that animal um, any sort of help. Uh, we also ask that people don't remove entanglements. So unfortunately, sometimes you can come across these animals that maybe get entangled in crab lines, um, you know, anything like that. Uh, and that's just one thing we ask people don't remove the entanglement. A lot of times that entanglement can be not completely removed and then we don't know how much of that gear is left on the animal. Um, we don't know if, you know, you cut that, um, cut that gear and that animal wasn't bleeding out until you cut that gear off and then that animal, animal bleeds out. Um, it's a, a lot of different things that can go wrong. So we definitely ask people to not push these animals back, um, not remove entanglements and call us um, as soon as possible. Uh, and this video is a little bit hard to watch, um, but this is a video of a live stranded um, Kodia. So this is a, a pygmy sperm whale um, that stranded in November 2018. Um, but this is essentially what, you know, when people arrive on the scene, this is what people are seeing. So this is a, a, a calf um, that's been obviously separated from its mom. Um, actually was septic and had, had a lot of things going wrong with it, but um, this is usually what it'll look like when, when people see a, a, a live stranded marine mammal. So it's a little tough to watch. Um, we were able to get to him and, and he mainly euthanized him, which was the best thing for him. Um, but unfortunately, that's not necessarily the easiest thing um, to have to see when we do that. But what we do recommend, um, you know, for our volunteers and our first responders, so those people that maybe are on the beach first and um, willing and able to help um, is helping us with the four S's. So we try to make this, make this easy when it comes to live animal response um, and remembering the four S's. So our first and foremost, um, safety is always our number one. Um, human safety is number one. So this person that actually took that video of that code, yeah, um, was by themselves. They were an older woman. Um, you know, it was not in anybody's best interest to, you know, push this animal uh, back onto shore, pull this animal on shore out of the surf when she was by herself. Um, and that animal was, you know, 150, 200 pounds. So just not a safe situation. So we'll always determine safety that, you know, comes with weather, um, lightning, surf height, the size of the animal, the disposition of the animal, all sorts of different things that go into that. So we never ask anybody to do anything that's going to be seeming unsafe for them or the animal. Um, our second S is, is sternal. So get that animal on its belly. You could see from that video um, a blowhole, right? Their blowhole is on the, the top of their head, so essentially on the back side of the animal. So you want to get them sternal, so on their sternum or on their belly to get that blowhole, or in the case of a manatee, get those nostrils above the water and get them um, access to be able to breathe. Uh, and then we also look at keeping their skin, whether it's um, protected, um, whether it's keeping it moist in the summer so they don't dry out or get sunburn, um, or if it's cold in the winter, keeping them warm, putting space blankets on them, um, that sort of thing. So keeping their skin just well protected. Um, when it comes to cetaceans, they have very thin baby skin, um, so they can blister and le legitimately burn in the sun uh, ridiculously quickly because they're not meant to be out in the sun if they're live stranded. Uh, and then our fourth S is silent. So obviously an animal that is live stranded, even dead ones can can attract a crowd. Uh, so that's usually one of our, our biggest things that we tell our volunteers and, and all of our volunteers are required to come to um, a training very similar to this. Um, we'd go over a lot of, you know, physically how to put an animal in a stretcher, um, what to do, how to take um, certain measurements, um, you know, how to take a respiration rate, things like that. So all of our volunteers are, are trained when it comes to live animal response. Um, but one of the biggest things that we ask for, um, you know, is always putting somebody in charge of keeping the crowds that usually come around uh, quiet and away from the animals. So especially in the case of the live animal, uh, maintaining, you know, a quiet crowd and maintaining the volunteers themselves as being quiet as well. It's already a stressful situation for that animal. Obviously, it's essentially like being abducted by aliens, right? Um, so keeping people quiet, um, keeping the crowd distant, uh, and that's the same, same case when it comes to dead animals as well. Unfortunately, people are weirdly curious um, and we've seen a lot of people do a lot of weird stuff when it comes to dead dolphins um, and dead manatees. Um, you know, so obviously it's not a safe situation. We've had people put their kids on top of dead dolphins to take photos, which is just the weirdest thing. 
Um, but obviously a, a dead mammal and a, a dead animals, uh, pro, you know, provides its own unsafe situation uh, when it comes to diseases and bacteria and, and things that maybe you just shouldn't put your child on a dead dolphin to take a picture of them, um, as well as, you know, just the, the safety of the, the animal, the crowd, all that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, people do a lot of weird stuff, but uh, our fourth S is definitely silent. That's keeping the crowd back and keeping it distant. Um, but number one for live animal response is give us a call as, as soon as possible um, and we'll be able to give further instruction of how to help and get our volunteers and then us on the scene as well. All right, so going into our dead animal response. Um, so just to put a, a warning label out there, um, we will have pictures of, of dead stuff, um, which I missed that warning label from the beginning. There's lots of pictures of dead stuff because majority of what we're dealing with is dead. Um, but like I was saying earlier, most of our strandings, you know, maybe one or two live strandings a year, most of our strandings are dead. Um, some of them look nice like this animal on the, uh, on the screen uh, where it still has skin. A lot of the times, most of the time they don't. Um, so even though the sharks got to this guy, um, it is it is nice to see animals that have skin because a lot of times they're not that fresh. And you guys being in the Northern Gulf know how it works when it comes to summertime and springtime and fall time and sometimes the winter. Um, it's hot and can, things can go um, from relatively uh, a fresh dead animal to, to an animal that's not so fresh dead. Uh, so we do deal with um, kind of uh, the whole swing of things when it comes to that. Uh, so one of our biggest questions that we get um, from the public and, and you know one of the things that we also are trying to answer too um, with our research is causes of death. So is there, are there patterns in our area? You know, are there patterns with certain species versus others? Um, you know, are there emerging pathogens? Are there potentially unusual events that are going on? Um, there's a lot of different questions. Is human interaction playing a big part um, in, you know, our population and maybe our population's demise? Um, so with causes of death, we do see a myriad, um, uh, but what I can kind of break down a little bit, which we've seen a lot this year, um, is freshwater exposure. So if you look at that top photo where that red arrow is pointing, those are actually what we call freshwater lesions. Um, so that happens in dolphins that are living or you know existing in um, prolonged low salinity water. So it's a really interesting dynamic of Mobile Bay because Mobile Bay is one of the largest freshwater discharges in the US. Um, so we see a lot of fresh water that, that comes down in the bay. And we ha also have a lot of dolphins that live solely in the bay. Um, so a lot of the times these dolphins are under this pressure consistently of low salinity water. Um, and potentially that can actually lead to their demise. So these freshwater lesions that you see on the outside of the animal is just a representation of what actually is happening internally as well. So I'll touch more on that um, with a case study later. Um, but that is one of our um, potentially leading causes of death here in, in Alabama and the Northern Gulf. Um, we also see cold stress in manatees. So I'm sure Elizabeth will talk to you guys about this tomorrow as well. But that photo of that manatee is actually a, a cold stressed um, manatee. So manatees are, are tropical species. They're not meant to survive in, in cold water. Um, and unfortunately for them, cold water is 68 degrees, uh, which we do get pretty much every winter here is we do get um, colder water than what they can handle. So those animals that potentially don't go back to Florida uh, in winter time and end up staying a little bit too long in our area actually does, um, they end up potentially being um, killed by cold stress um, as well. So that can actually um, kind of uh, show, look a little bit like frostbite. So you can see all those white lesions on the skin. Um, that's simply just because that animal's um, body, external body is shutting down in order for it to maintain um, some sort of, um, you know, life-saving systems for its internal organisms. Uh, we also see pathogens, um, obviously, so we get animals that, you know, will die from a uh, kind of variety of, you know, these natural deaths, so potentially animals that are of old age, um, you know, or have heart disease, um, you know, things that potentially there's an outbreak going on. So we can have viral outbreaks. Um, you know, they're just very, very similar to us in the sense that they can have, uh, you know, virus go through a population and, and can kill some and not others. Um, so we actually do look for those as well um, when we're doing these necropsies. Um, unfortunately, in our area, we see uh, a rather large amount of fisheries interactions. Um, we don't see boat strikes as often, so that picture in the bottom right is an example of a boat strike on that dolphin that actually did, uh, um, did end up leading to that dolphin's death. 
Um, but unfortunately, we do see a lot of fisheries interactions. So not necessarily always um, as the demise of the animal. So potentially it's just something where they um, steal fish off a hook and they actually end up you know, swallowing the hook as well. Uh, we'll find hooks in stomachs, we'll find line. Um, but unfortunately, we are one of the only states that uh, still has gill netting um, that is legal here. And we do see a lot of gill net interactions um, where dolphins will drown um, in parakeet underwater entra entrapment, which is essentially them um, you know, dry drowning, um, underwater being trapped in gill net. So we do see that, unfortunately, all too frequently in our area. Um, and then we also have things like unusual mortality events. So we actually are just coming out of an unusual mortality event last year, um, again, in, related in, in relation to freshwater exposure. So um, we had a lot of freshwater in our area last year as well as this year. Um, so those events can be all sorts of events. They can be naturally caused by freshwater, you know, coming down the watershed, or it can be things like viruses, um, that sort of things that actually takes out a large mass of the population happening at once, which is very similar to what us humans are going through right now as well. Now, what do you do if you find a dead marine mammal? So this is what we always tell the public. We always want them to call us as soon as possible, um, take as many photos, of clear photos of the animal as they can. Um, that's very, very important. We can't count something as a stranding unless we have a photo, unfortunately. Um, we do recommend people using a size reference, but that's kind of, you know, just get us a photo as, as well as you can. Um, we ask for a GPS um, point for location and then a clear description of the location and the animal. So we want to know if we're preparing for a, a fetus, you know, that's maybe only 80 centimeters long versus if we're, you know, looking at a, an 8 to 10 foot large male bottomless dolphin that weighs 500 pounds. Um, that's going to change what kind of equipment we bring with us when we go to respond to these animals. Um, you know, obviously, if it's a live stranding versus a dead stranding, that's also going to change the equipment uh, that we bring. Usually. Uh, we'll bring very different things when it comes to a live animal versus a dead animal. Um, and then it depends also how dead the animal is as well. So if somebody finds a mummified skeleton out on the very far west end of Dauphin Island, what we take for samples from that animal are going to be very different than what we would take from a fresh dead animal. Um, you know, most of the time we're going to bring those fresh dead animals back to our lab um, to do a, a full necropsy, whereas versus those mummified you know, uh, remains are, are likely going to stay out at on the on the beach and we're just going to go sample it to make sure we've got everything that we can get from it if it has teeth left if it has any sort of soft tissue left um, which most of the time they don't uh, but just going to definitely change uh, what samples we take as well and what we need to to bring in order to take those samples um, and then also you know can we access it do we need to take a boat do we take our truck um, are we going to get stuck is it high tide is it low tide that sort of thing um, so it's a, a lot to, to coordinate when it comes to just picking up a dead animal. It's not uh, the most straightforward or, or easy thing sometimes either. You might go to the east eastern shore of the bay and we've got, you know, six to eight foot um, seawalls that we have to try to deal with and try getting a 500 pound dolphin over a six to eight foot seawall is a little bit more complicated than going and picking up, you know, a hundred centimeter baby that we can just throw in a trash bag and carry on our back. So, which is a weird image, I know, but just truth. That's pretty much reality of, of most of my job, which is a blast. Um, and again, a reminder is to never push a marine mammal back in the water that's dead or alive. Um, a lot of the times if we're doing a, a field sampling and that sort of thing where we can't bring the animal back or the animal's too far gone that we don't have um, the, the resources to spend on that animal if it's already too far gone, we'll actually field sample it usually where it's stranded. Um, and then a lot of times we will actually ourselves walk it out or take a boat and pull it out and to tow that carcass out so it doesn't re restrand or, or stay on somebody's yard and us get complaints about it later on. Um, so a big thing too is to not remove any fishing gear, um, rope or et cetera, that's present on the animal. So very similar to a live animal. Um, but this is more for us to document um, potential evidence just in case it come it becomes a uh, a law enforcement case. So if you look at that, that larger photo on the left, um, that was actually an animal in 2014 that was shot with an arrow. Um, so you can see that arrow just sticking out of its right side there. Um, unfortunately, that animal lived for what they think is uh, three days with that arrow in its back before it died. Um, which is really unfortunate. That animal stranded over in Baldwin County. Um, but they that actually, of course, turned into a law enforcement case. Again, these are federally protected animals that you cannot shoot with an arrow, nor I don't know why you would. Um, but it actually turned out to be a 15-year-old kid that, um, that did end up shooting that dolphin with an arrow. 
um, and it did it did turn into legal case. So um, things like that, we never want to remove or move a carcass um, unless you know we've um, instructed people to do so, just because it it simply can become a law enforcement case as well. Um, and then again, all those things can potentially go back into how we manage um, you know the protected species in our area. Uh, same with when it comes to um, fishing gear, like in that animal. So now just kind of touching on um, our necropsy. So this is actually a photo of our necropsy suite um, at the Marine Mammal Research Center. So um, we do have a building on the Sea Labs campus. Um, it's the newest building on campus. It is beautiful. Um, it's a great building um, and a, we have a wonderful necropsy suite. Um, so you actually can see on that back wall there, uh, we have a walk-in freezer on the left and then we have a walk-in cold room as well. So um, currently, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we're not able to use volunteers like we normally would. Um, and we're not able to necropsy as well because of course necropsying you know, requires about 10 to 15 people standing in very close proximity with each other. So unfortunately, we're not um, doing necropsies right now. So we actually have eight carcasses in the freezer. Um, so once we can get um, our necropsies going again, that'll definitely um, take us a while to burn through those. But um, we do have, we have essentially the space enough to fit, you know, even even more carcasses in that, which is actually very nice um, and, and for sure a, a great uh, feature of this building as well. Um, we also have a minus 80 um, ultra cold freezer. So that's where we're kind of keeping, we keep our archive samples in there, um, future research samples, that sort of thing. Um, for, for projects down the road. Um, we do have a crane system that lifts um, 2,000 pounds. So, you know, obviously for the largest manatees that we get, that could be, you know, upwards of 2,000 or even more pounds. Um, we're actually able to, to get them into the building right off the truck um, into the room and on a table. Uh, honestly, with only about two people, one person driving the crane and, and one person there um, being able to place the table under the animal. So um, very, very cool. We like to, what we say, uh, work smarter, not harder. Uh, and especially with these animals that are, are large, you know, there's not a lot um, that we can do without the use of our equipment and our tools, um, just simply because we are not as big as they are. Um, unless, obviously, they're baby dolphins and then it's a breeze. You can, again, like I said, throw them in a trash bag and put them over your back. So um, our what and whys for necropsy. So like I said earlier, one of our biggest um, reasons for um, being out and, and picking up these dead animals simply is to figure out, you know, what's going on with our population, what's causing their deaths, are there any um, emerging issues that are going on, are there any um, issues going on with human interaction, that sort of thing. So uh, essentially we do a thorough examination of internal um, and external uh, marine mammal bodies um, in order to determine the cause of death. That's kind of our our little specialty of necropsy. Uh, but then again, all of that goes into play into um, changing, building, developing conservation policies, um, potentially changes in law enforcement, or at least allowing law enforcement to uh, potentially be involved in cases and that sort of thing. And then performing outreach as well. So a lot of this, the times, you know, we're able to to save a few rib bones, or we're able to save a skull and clean it. Um, and then we'll actually bring those to outreach events, and people that normally wouldn't be able to see a bottomless dolphin skull can can hold and touch and feel a bottomless dolphin skull, which is pretty cool. Um, that's one of my favorite parts, especially since my background is on in osteology. So I'm all about uh, saving a lot of bones. Probably if the staff were to answer, probably too many bones, but that's okay. Um, so like I said earlier, uh, it takes a village to do a necropsy, which I'm sure you guys also saw um, when you guys did the turtle necropsy with Lindsay. Lindsay, Lindsay herself is a village, so she's able to do those by herself a lot of time. Um, marine mammals, it's a, a little bit different. Um, we can do necropsies with as little as two people, um, but it's, it's very difficult. Um, so a lot of times we do like to have an ample number of people with us in the room. Um, especially when it comes to these larger animals, simply because a lot of the time uh, is taken up from just simply breaking that animal down and fitting them into barrels, which actually you can see in that photo, um, which are then rendered. So uh, we do try to <laughs> take a, a bit of time to just try to break down those animals and put them into, into barrels. But as you can see, I kind of highlighted all different roles that we take. Um, there's a lot of different roles. Uh, we have a lot of people that, that are needed um, for, for necropsies. Um, and we collect a lot of samples. So that's a, a really big reason for having so many people is we always have somebody that's in charge of letting us, um, of leading us in, in sample taking as well. So we take samples for stable isotope analysis, age determination, 
Um, we look at contaminants um, in these animals, see if there's anything going on there. Biotoxins, so things like red tide, specifically in manatees, that's a really important um, point of research. Um, we take histopathology, so that really helps us determine cause of death and any sort of pathological things that were going on in the animal. Um, we do various research project collaborations, so we actually are working with um, the College of Charleston, um, looking at microplastics in stomachs um, of dolphins in the Gulf right now, which is um, a really interesting project, and hopefully that'll come out um, here shortly. Uh, we also do stomach content analysis, so you know what these animals are eating, um, which can also have some very interesting um, results as well, uh, human interactions and et cetera. So we take uh, a lot of samples, um, which is why we have such a large freezer, um, but we also, uh, you know, we do a lot with those samples as well. So we all have a lot of active research going on um, using all those samples, which is a great thing, but um, it definitely takes a lot of people to get all of those samples. Um, so this is just a really cool video. I know if you guys have been to our, our training, you have seen this before, but this is essentially a time lapse of a bottomless dolphin uh, necropsy. So it's broken down to only about 20 seconds, I believe. Um, but you can actually see in this, all the different roles um, and all the different people. Um, so all the samples coming out of the animal, we've got photographers taking photos, um, you know, breaking the animal down at the end. Hopefully you guys can all see this. So that's pretty much uh, probably a, a five, five hour necropsy um, down to, to 20 seconds. Um, so a lot of the times our necropsies are usually about, you know, four to five hours, depending on how fresh the animal is or how many problems uh, it has. A lot of the times it can take us upwards of eight to ten hours as well. Um, manatees are about the same thing as dolphins as well. Unless, you know, we have those little babies. They're very, very easy. Oh, and it's going to play again. There we go. All right, so what I wanted to do was kind of go over um, two of our most recent stranding cases with you guys, um, just because these are really fun and this kind of shows, um, you know, what our kind of day-to-day -day is um, and hopefully, you know, what all of our samples and everything that we take can actually lead to. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, manatee stranding that we had back in January, as well as a dolphin stranding that we had in April. Um, so, oh, it looks like I spelled that name wrong too, that's fine. Um, so our first, the manatee that stranded, um, stranded in January um, 2020. So this was an adult male, um, 266 centimeters, um, 316 kigs, um, a relatively thin um, manatee uh, that stranded dead in Diamond Head, Mississippi in January 2020. Um, actually, I'm gonna pause right there, my battery is dying. Pause one second. I will be right back so I don't lose you guys all. Hold on one second. Okay, there we go. All right, we're good, we're still here, lovely. All right, so um, stranded dead in Diamond Head, Mississippi. So like I said earlier, we do also respond to manatees in uh, Mississippi, um, as well as Alabama. And then the dolphin that I'm gonna talk to you about was also an adult male, um, a 257 centimeters, so a very large dolphin, um, pretty comparable to the size of that uh, adult male manatee, and about uh, 500 pounds or 225 kigs. That animal stranded dead in Fort Morgan, um, if you guys, you guys probably know where that is, down on the peninsula on, in Baldwin County um, in April. So a little bit about the manatee first. So at necropsy of this animal, um, we found that it was in thin body condition. So a lot of times their bellies um, up top will actually be much more round um, and they'll be a lot deeper than this animal was. So this animal was in unfortunately thin body condition. It did also have depleted mesenteric fat. So a lot of times these guys are, you know, constantly eating. Um, they have a lot of fat in their bodies and actually you can see pretty much all of this animal's GI tract, which normally that's pretty much all covered in these little finger shaped um, fat. 
So it's essentially fat that's all mesenteric and it's all attached to the mesentery, um, but it's usually they're just covered in that fat. That fat will be nice big layers of these kind of finger shaped um, fat deposits. And this animal virtually had no mesenteric fat or visceral fat at all. Um, so obviously it had starved so much that it had eaten through its fat um, and its fat stores. It also had a decreased amount of GI contents um, with firm and dry feces. So that's actually an image of their feces um, or of this animal species that were very dry. Um, obviously, it looked like this animal was very dehydrated. Um, and because it didn't have um, anything in its stomach, actually, it was obviously hadn't eaten for a long time. And like I said, manatees usually are eating all the time unless they're traveling. Um, so that was another potential sign that um, this animal was dehydrated and not eating and hadn't eaten in a while. Um, we also saw these eruptive nodules on the animal's skin. So this is actually an image taken um, kind of face first, like looking back at the animal. Uh, and you can see those kind of eruptive white lesions um, that are all over its face. Um, those, like I said earlier, when I showed that image um, earlier of that animal, it looked like it had, you know, essentially frostbite. That's essentially what happens here is it'll actually have these eruptive sores um, that will be essentially like frostbite when um, their body is shutting down the um, kind of blood flow to the external parts of its body. Um, so that's what we actually call cold stress lesions. Uh, and then finally, it had congested lungs um, that had nodules uh, and a mild burden of parasites. Um, so those congested lungs obviously pointed to pneumonia. There, were, um, there was fluid free floating in the lungs. Um, so unfortunately, that was just, that's not a normal finding in these cases. Usually they have aerated, um, nice air filled lungs, but this animal's lungs were unfortunately um, definitely wet and, and had signs of pneumonia as well as nodules um, and parasites. So essentially what we do is we take samples of all of these body systems and any kind of pathologies that we find as well as our, our kind of normal tissue. Um, we send it out to a histopathologist and with this case, um, histology actually confirmed that the death was likely due to cold stress. Um, so that was kind of a, not necessarily an easy uh, way to come around to uh, you know, what, what we thought killed this animal, but on necropsy, that's what we assumed. Um, and then we get that confirmation back from the, histolog um, the histologist. And uh, that was uh, pretty easy to determine. It was a manatee that was still here in January. And, and by then we had already had a lot of cold days and the water temperatures were not at all um, what manatees need to have. So that animal was a pretty cut and dry um, case for us. Now, this next dude for our dolphin friend, that was not necessarily the case. So this animal um, had a lot of things going on with it. Um, so I'm just going to kind of give you only five of our significant findings that we had on necropsy. So again, this is what this animal looked like. Um, as you can see, that is not what a bottlenose dolphin normally looks like. Um, obviously, they don't have those spots and speckles all over. So those are actually... Um, skin lesions that are more than likely consistent with freshwater, um, prolonged freshwater uh, exposure, uh, which was very odd because this animal actually stranded on the Gulf side of Fort Morgan, um, where the salinity that day was in the 30s, um, which is a, a regular, you know, um, Gulf of Mexico salinity. Um, not a regular bay salinity for sure, but it's definitely on the Gulf side of things, um, not an abnormal salinity to have but a high salinity. So this animal is obviously experiencing prolonged freshwater exposure, but must not have died where it was living. Um, unfortunately, uh, this animal upon necropsy, we actually were um, discovered that it did have a healed old um, bullet wound in it as well. Um, so it did not contribute to the death of the animal. Um, it was already healed and, and it looked relatively old. Um, compared to the animal. So that was an unfortunate finding, but um, not a cause of death. Um, that still is now property of law enforcement. So NOAA law enforcement um, uh, will pick that, that, that bullet slug up um, and they'll actually keep it in their repository if they're ever able to find a match um, to the type of gun and that sort of thing. Um, but it did not contribute to the death of the animal. It also had a small brain, so in, compared to a normal sized brain, its brain was relatively small, um, and it did not have the, the normal um, looking and normal shaped gyrene and sulci, which are you know, the grooves, the ebbs and flows of, of what the brain is supposed to look like. They were actually flattened. Um, and what that can mean is actually cerebral edema. So their, their brain was, was filled with fluid essentially and pushing up against the skull. 
so instead of having those normal gyrae and, and sulcae, those were actually getting flattened by being pushed up against the skull. So that means that that brain was actually swollen, um, which is probably a very unfortunate way to be living. Um, the heart um, was enlarged as well as all the vessels, um, which potentially could just be a, a sign of, um, of heart disease. Um, when, when dolphins get older, just like humans, when they get older, um, you know, their heart potentially can have issues um, trying to pump blood and then therefore is working a lot harder so it can get actually enlarged. Um, it also had blood clots. As you can see, the, all those little adhesions are, are blood clots, um, which is not normal. Um, so something was going on there. We're not totally sure what. Um, and then finally, the uh, left pectoral flipper, um, so you can see this a picture of it, um, look like if you were looking down on that fin, um, the scapulo uh, humeral joint was actually deformed. So that again also was probably not a contributor to its death, um, but it was an interesting finding. Um, the right pectoral fin was totally normal, it had a normal looking ball and joint. Um, connection, uh, but this one was, was deformed both on the, um, the scapula head um, as well as the humeral head. So um, really, really interesting. And histology is still pending for this case. Um, we're more than likely, you know, upon gross findings at necropsy, uh, the animal likely died due to prolonged freshwater exposure, but there was a lot of other stuff going on with him, which was really, um, really interesting. So it's kind of a fun little peek into what these dolphins are doing and what these manatees are doing during their lives. Um, that, you know, we had just end up finding out after they died. And with that, that is pretty much all I have for you guys. Uh, just a reminder, I put the phone numbers up here again, um, and I'll take any questions that you guys have. I thank you guys for your listening. And I'm glad my computer didn't die. Cool. Well, thank you very much. Um, we have quite a few questions in the chat box. Uh, oh, good. Eric, would you like to ask your question? Um, looks like yours is the first one. I don't know if you heard me. Did you hear me, Eric? Did you want to ask your question? It's the first one. <laughs> Let me scroll up. Uh, let's see, let's see. All right. First off, how are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for listening. <laughs> uh, you know, you know. Uh, do you think the storms that we like we're having during this time of the year would increase strandings or re remain the same? That is an awesome question. So we actually do see an increase in strandings after hurricanes and tropical storms. So actually we see an increase in live animal strandings after hurricanes and tropical storms. So a lot of the times uh, we think it might be calves that are getting separated from their moms um, or animals that are just thrown off course um, and end up coming in and stranding. So we actually do see an increase after hurricanes and storms. Interesting. Um, I guess we'll just keep going in order. Uh, Cody has a question, is after Eric's. Hi. Um, Hi. Kind of a, I guess a dumb question, but um, have humans affected the salinity levels in Mobile Bay or can all of that be attributed to uh, the effects of climate change? So, so that, is, that is a good question. That's not a dumb question. Um, so Mobile Bay, we are much more of a natural system. So that is, it's primarily what's happening in the north. So uh, the Mobile Bay watershed drains a vast chunk of the Midwest actually. So um, a lot of that, you know, we can we can talk about things like pesticides that are coming down with that runoff and that sort of thing, which obviously is going to be a contaminant issue and potential um, biotoxins that are changing. Um, but when we're just looking at the freshwater itself, a lot of that is going to be kind of that um, natural process that is for sure going to be changed and sped up when it comes to climate change. Um, but you know, there are certain ways that humans can affect, affect freshwater coming into systems. So a lot of um, things have to do, uh, you know, with where we're 
pushing that freshwater to and if that freshwater used to go in that spot or if you've changed where that freshwater is going. So things like the Bonnet Carey Spillway, if you guys have, have heard about that, um, that goes into the Mississippi Sound. So um, that actually since freshwater doesn't normally come out at that rate that it did last year, um, that actually did change the freshwater breakdown um, and and prolonged freshwater that the dolphins were uh, having to go through last year in the Mississippi Sound. So Mobile Bay is mostly a natural system um, that's just going to continue to be, um, you know, it's probably increased and, and probably prolonged um, when it comes to climate change. But for our system, it's more natural. Other ones, not necessarily. And humans can influence that. Oh, cool. interesting. And yeah, I agree. I thought that was a good question. Not a dumb one. I was curious myself. Um, Camille, if you can hear, uh, did you want to ask your questions after Cody's? Yeah, um, so I was going to ask, what was the most interesting mammal that you've come into contact with? But I just recently put a chat in. Um, considering that the bay feeds into the Gulf, do you think it's probable that that, that that dolphin may have come from like the Fish River area, if you're familiar with that? Uh, yes, so uh, kind of fun story about that dolphin. So um, we actually weirdly name our dead dolphins, um, helps us remember them. So that actually, that dead dolphin, his name was Titan. Um, and that's the only way I remember him, um, but minus everything that was wrong with him. He actually, we do have um, him uh, matched with our photo ID team. So our photo ID team actually was able to match him and he was seen on two occasions up in the bay. So actually um, up near, more so on the, on the west side, so over by Dog River. Um, so not necessarily Fish River, but we do get a lot of dolphins um, over there in, in Fish River as well. Um, a lot of things that we know that our dolphins, our, our dolphins just live with freshwater all the time so we're not sure if our i should say our dolphins the dolphins that live in mobile bay are, are pretty much exposed to freshwater a lot so um if they have a higher you know ability to withstand it we're not sure but um, we do know that that animal actually did live um at least those two occasions that our photo id team saw him um he was up in the bay so for some reason maybe he was trying to to seek out um, higher salinities and it wasn't enough to to cut it very cool, thank you. And then the coolest mammal, um, for sure, we had a beaked whale. Um, so beaked whale, super cool. They've got fun little tusks um, the males um, use and they fight with those tusks actually um, that we assisted with stranded in Pensacola and we um, did the necropsy at our, our facility. That was a blast. He's a 14 foot, awesome, mature uh, beaked whale. Pretty cool. That happened in 2018, right? 20, hey, thank you. That happened in 2019, July 8th, 2019. Yeah. Cool. Um, I'll go ahead and ask uh, Ashley's question because I know her microphone is unreasonably loud. But uh, she asked, what is some of the basic equipment you would take uh, for any stranding situation, for any stranding regardless of the situation? So our truck is actually fully equipped with a crane on the back of it. Um, it is uh, it can lift 2,000 pounds dead from the ground, which is awesome. Um, so that is um, built into the bed of our truck. So for sure, we always bring our truck. Um, we always bring equipment for if the animal were to die. So if it was a live animal, we always bring our dead animal equipment. Um, so that would be things you know like stretchers, straps, um, bungee cords, tarps, ropes. Um, all sorts of different things that we just need to physically manipulate that animal to get it out of wherever it is and into the back of our truck um, or into a trailer. And if it's a live animal, we actually have an enclosed trailer that has heating and AC that we also use um, for an animal that is that is live and needs to be transported. But always our truck is our, our number one go-to. Cool. Um, Austin actually has a couple of questions um, if you want to ask. Um, one or both of your questions, Austin. I'll go with the easy one first. How do you personally handle the odor during the autopsy, <laughs> the necropsies over such a long period of time? Yeah, I was. That's a. It's a good question. Um, so I, yeah, we already talked about um, Vicks is always a good option. Um, I fortunately or unfortunately, I'm not sure if it's either one. Um, I don't have a problem with it. Um, honestly, I, I am not a huge fan of the turtle smell. So for some reason, reptiles smell way worse to me than mammals. Um, so I unfortunately have, or fortunately I'm not, I think it's fortunately for my job has just 
I've just developed a, a tolerance to it. Um, so I don't really have an issue. Um, the, the grossest thing that really grosses me out is not the smell. It's usually when, when the brain is decomposed and dripping out of the skull, that's usually when I have a problem. And that, at that point, it's just like, okay, we're going to work with that later. Let's just do everything else until we'll get to that. We'll scoop some out and be done with it. <laughs> the other question was, does the stranding network have access to any equipment in order to move manatees if they get stuck somewhere? Because I've talked to Elizabeth before, and um, I think she said that they usually get stuck somewhere higher up in the bay or other areas where they can't get back out to the open water to get down south again. Is there any equipment that y'all can use to move them? Yeah, yeah. So that's a great question. And yes, um, so a lot of the times when, and you're talking live animals, live manatees. Yeah. Um, so uh, when they, when we have, you know, situations where they are, are stranded live, um, cold stress, you know, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll hunker down by a spring or some sort of warm water refuge that we have here in Alabama, which is um, usually in a marina or some sort of, um, you know, outflow area. Uh, and unfortunately, we don't have anything that we can move them ourselves. So a lot of times when that happens, we'll actually have to call in um, our our fellow, fellow network partners, uh, but primarily SeaWorld. So SeaWorld has um, a boat that we're actually able to use that they'll drive up. Um, it has a removable transom, so the engine's actually mounted at the front of the boat or actually in the middle of the boat. Um, and it has a removable transom, so you can actually catch the manatee, pull the manatee onto the boat, put the transom back in, um, and then and then take the, the animal um, into rehab um, or wherever it needs to go depending on the situation um, but our trailer our enclosed trailer we are able to transport animals um, once we get them out of the water but we don't have anything that's unfortunately one of the things that's missing from the northern gulf um, we do have to rely on our our florida comrades for that which we love them so it's fine but it's just another waiting game Cool. So um, last question just to end things, and um, I'll just go ahead and ask it because it's Cody and Boris both asked uh, a similar question, and if either of you have anything to add, um, you're welcome to. Um, are there any volunteer opportunities in this area for marine animal watches is what Cody asked, and then um, Boris just asked about opportunities to tour the facility. Yeah, yeah. So um, definitely. Um, so volunteers, we're always uh, hungry for volunteers. Uh, right now is a weird time. So we're not using volunteers, nor do we have any plans right now to um, mostly just because um, our, our main volunteer base is a lot of retirees. So it's a lot of older people um, that we just don't want to, you know, get any um, get anybody into anything that they don't need to be getting into. Um, but we do have a, a lot of people um, that you know, we always want more help, especially when it comes to necropsy. And like I said, we've got eight carcasses in the freezer right now. So when we uh, are able to necropsy those, we're definitely going to need a lot of people um, probably for, you know, a good week or two going through those carcasses. Um, but then, uh, yeah, touring the facility for sure. That's just a matter of, yeah, reach out to me. We're happy to um, happy to do that. I don't have my email on here, but um, I'm sure that you guys can get it um, from Carrie. So yeah. lots of opportunities. Please, please come be our people. I know Brittany has already come to a training, so that's, you got one amongst you. Cool, awesome. Well, um, it is uh, past time. If anybody else has any last minute questions um, that you want answered, uh, I'll, you're, you're welcome to ask. I see Eric has a hand up. <laughs> if you was to be either a manatee or a dolphin, which one would you be? Oh, gosh. Uh, I think I would be a dolphin. Uh, yeah, manatees, man, they get hit by boats all the time and just run over, whereas we don't really have to deal with that when you're a dolphin. So poor manatee. I can't imagine being run over by a boat and then surviving it. And pretty much all of them do. So I'd rather be a dolphin for that. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. Well, um, what a question I, to wrap things up. I, I <laughs> <laughs> Ask Elizabeth that tomorrow. I'd be curious to see to hear her answer. Yeah, I mean, she's only going to be talking about manatees, so if she says dolphins, I'll be a little surprised. But I can, you won't say dolphin. I can guarantee it. Yeah, probably. <laughs> awesome. She's well, a manatee thanks. fiend. Thanks Thank you guys so much chatting with us, Mackenzie. It was really informative. And um, 
yeah, hopefully we'll send you some volunteers soon. Awesome. That sounds great. Thanks so much, Carrie. Thanks so much, everybody. Cool. Thank See you, you later.